Okay, uh, thanks so much, Cameron. And uh, so yes, I'll be talking about the missing baryons. As you'll see soon enough, they're not actually missing anymore, but we just don't know much about them. So without further ado, um, so to put this in context, let's see if this movie will play. Okay, so I'm showing a movie here. This is showing the global structure of the universe. And it started from t equals zero. You can see it's moving forward. The universe is about 13 billion years old. So that's where it's going to stop. And through gravity, what happens is there's small overdensities in the early universe. And they grow and they get bigger over time. Gravity keeps sucking more material in. And so eventually, you get to the present day universe, and it looks like this. And so what you can see is there's these bright spots that are called nodes. And that's where the largest aggregations of matter are. And they're connected by these long, thin structures. And those long, thin structures are called filaments. And so I'm going to be coming back to filaments throughout this talk. So this is just a visual representation of what those look like. So we can further zoom in a little bit. Um, here's another movie. And what we're doing now is we're looking close in at one of the largest nodes. And so the largest nodes, uh, it's the largest aggregation of matter. And so these are galaxy clusters. And galaxy clusters contain about 1,000 individual galaxies, so 1,000 objects the size of our own Milky Way. Um, and you know, each one of these galaxies has something like 100 billion stars. So to give you a size of, you know, some context for how big these objects are. And so you can see right in the top here, that's where this galaxy cluster is forming. All the matter just keeps flowing into it. And again, you can see all of these long, thin filamentary structures that are connected to it. So another thing to point out that'll come up later in the talk is you can see these filaments, they're not uniform, right? The filaments themselves have somewhat brighter spots within the filaments. You know, some of them are a bit dimmer and more diffuse. Some of them are a little more concentrated. And so there's a pretty large diversity of uh, constituents within these filaments, and that's going to come up more later on as well. OK, so now that we know what the universe looks like, what is it made out of? And so the vast majority in the present day is dark energy. And you can see in the pie chart here, it's something like 72%. This is a bit outdated, but it's the nicest looking pie chart I could find. Um, dark matter is something like 23%. And then the normal atoms, you know, making up all of us, the Earth, the Sun, everything else, that's something like 4 or 5%. So it's a pretty small fraction of the overall universe. But what we're going to talk about today is what makes up this 4 to 5% of normal atoms in the universe. OK, so here's yet another pie chart. And this pie chart is breaking up how the normal atoms are distributed. So we'll start with the stars. So the stars like our sun, that's something like 7% of the normal atoms. And then you'll see there's this long list of other things, and it's all gas, right? And so this is all gas of different temperatures. And so if we start at the top here, the gas in galaxy clusters is about 100 million degrees. And the reason it's 100 million degrees is these galaxy clusters are so massive and so large, this gas started out you know, very far away, and it gets pulled in under gravity. And gravity is so strong, it's like dropping it. You, know, you can imagine how tall of a building the equivalent dropping is. And so all of this energy gets converted to motion. And that motion then eventually gets converted to random motions, which is heat and temperature. And so galaxy clusters are so big that they turn this gas into 100 million Kelvin. And so you can keep working your way down. So this, this gas in galaxy clusters, you know, the big nodes that you saw earlier, that's something like 4% of the normal atoms. So still not a whole lot of it. You can go the next object down, which is called galaxy groups. And so galaxy groups, instead of having 1,000 galaxies, have something like 10 to 100 galaxies. So they're a bit smaller. Because they're smaller, the gas is a bit colder. It's only 10 million degrees. And that's another few percent. So then you can see the next three things on here are the filaments. And so these filaments actually contain the vast majority of what we think is the normal matter in our universe. And these filaments, again, they're quite diverse. And so the temperature of the gas in these filaments has a pretty big range. The very hottest gas in these filaments we think is about a million degrees. And that's the primary gas that I'm going to talk about today that we're aiming to study and that we know the least about. There's also gas that's of order 100,000 degrees. That's you know, something like 15%. And that's better understood through UV studies. Uh, there's even cooler gas, uh, which is about 10,000 degrees. And then way down at the bottom, there's also gas within galaxies. And that's the last couple percent. 
So then again, this, this circled part of the pie chart, this 39% here that's the hottest gas in filaments, that's what we're going to focus on. OK, so um, I guess maybe to start, as I said, the, the baryons, they're not actually missing anymore. We know that they're there. And the reason that we know they're there is um, probably the best technique is fast radio bursts. You can look for the pulse delays in these radio bursts. And the pulse delay tells you how much gas that those photons have passed through getting from the fast radio burst to Earth. And so from that, you can add up how, you know, how much gas there is between us and this radio burst. And you look at multiple areas in the sky, you add up all this gas, and it adds up to the right amount. So this gas is no longer missing. There's no longer missing baryons. But the issue is all you get out of this measurement is how much is there. There's still a lot of questions left over. And so some of the questions you can think about, to put this in analogy, so we're talking about gas. It's a lot like the Earth's atmosphere. And so if I told you there's five quadrillion tons of gas in the Earth's atmosphere, you'd say, OK, great. That's a good number to know. But there's really a lot of other questions I have, right? Of how is this gas distributed? You know, are, are we down here at Pasadena, where it's nice and easy to breathe? Are we up on the summit of Everest, where we're sucking for air? You know, how's, how's the distribution of this gas? Also, what's the temperature of the gas? Are, are we sitting in Death Valley in the middle of summer, you know, absolutely sweating and overheating? Are we in Alaska in January, freezing? Are we somewhere in between? And then, of course, how windy is it, right? Are, are we in Florida in the middle of a hurricane? Are we on a beach in Hawaii with a nice, gentle breeze? You know, all of these are important questions that have a lot of impact of how we're experiencing our atmosphere. And so we have these same exact questions about this gas that makes up these missing baryons. Okay, so then how do we study this gas? It's 100 million, or sorry, excuse me, it's about a million Kelvin. So where do we look? So, if, if you, so here's the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, there's a wavelength scale here. You can see radio, microwave, submillimeter. You can see what size this corresponds to. And then at the bottom, there's a temperature scale. You can convert photon energy into a temperature. And so as you get to you know, X-rays and gamma rays, you're getting to a higher effective temperature. And so you can see, you know, on this scale, our own sun, the surface of the sun is about 5,000 degrees. And so 5,000 degrees corresponds to optical wavelengths. That's why our eyes are sensitive to those wavelengths. But we have to keep going all the way to a million degrees, right? And so at a million degrees, you can see, so ultraviolet goes up to about something like 300,000. So at a million degrees, we're in the X-ray regime. So if we want to study gas that's a million degrees, we have to look in X-rays. OK, and so at this point, we now have, there's this beautiful new X-ray mission that uh, launched a few years ago. It's called Irizita, and it's an X-ray mission. It's surveying the entire sky the same way that SphereX that Jamie talked about earlier is. And from this all-sky survey, we have this newfound sensitivity to these filamentary structures. Irizita is detecting all of these filaments in the X-rays. And on the right, you can see an example image. So there's two galaxy clusters, which again are these largest nodes in the cosmic web. And connecting them in blue here is one of the filaments that Irizita detected. So we now have nice detections in the x-rays of this gas. But the issue is it's difficult to disentangle the physical properties. You can detect the gas, but disentangling the distribution or the density of it from the temperature of the gas is really difficult when all you have is the x-ray observation. In addition, from the x-ray capabilities that we currently have, there's no way of figuring out what the velocity structure of this gas is. So we're left with a lot of the same questions, even though we have detected it. And so what we aim to do is actually add microwave information. And so by adding microwave information, we can actually disentangle this. And on the right here is a microwave image. This is from the Planck satellite. And these two big red dots, those are two more galaxy clusters. So they're, they're two more of these big nodes. And the extended emission that's going from the bottom left to the upper right is the filament seen in the microwave data. So at this point, let's stop and go back to the electromagnetic spectrum. If I told you before, it's a million degree gas. And I said we have to look in the x-rays. You can see x-rays way on the right. And microwave is way on the left. So why can we look in the microwaves and actually see what's going on with this million degree gas? How is that helpful? So it turns out it's a scattering process. So exactly what Jamie mentioned earlier, there's the cosmic microwave background. It permeates the entire universe. And that background in the present day has cooled to about three degrees. So it's extremely cold. 
and it's extremely cold, and that's why it's in the microwaves. If you look at that chart on the previous page, you know, three degrees is microwave wavelengths. But what happens is you take one of these electrons in the million degree gas, and it scatters off of one of these three Kelvin photons. And as you might imagine, the scattering process adds energy to the photon. So the photon comes out at higher energy. The electron loses a bit of energy, but you know, it's, it's a million degrees, so it's a pretty small perturbation on that electron. And so this is the way we can actually use microwave data to study what's going on with million degree gas. Okay, so then if we want to look in the microwaves, great. How do we do that? And the problem is microwaves are absorbed by water. And this is the same way that microwave ovens cook your food. So the atmosphere, even on a very clear day like today, unfortunately has quite a lot of water vapor in it. And so looking through the water vapor is difficult in microwaves. And so what we're aiming to do is put a balloon up. So it's a much smaller scale project than the satellite that Jamie talked about. But from this balloon, we can actually get up above the atmosphere. And so for some context, with the balloon that we're looking at, the balloon itself is the size of a large football stadium. And it has enough lift that it can lift a payload of about 8,000 pounds up to an altitude of about 120,000 feet. And it can stay up there for almost a month. So you have this high observing platform above most of the atmosphere. And so all the water in the atmosphere is no longer a problem. So uh, at this point, we've built and flown a microwave telescope on a balloon. It has an eight and a half foot mirror. You can see some folks on the project there with the telescope behind them. Uh, it was an engineering flight that was successful. And actually, just last month, we reproposed to NASA to perform a science flight. And so we'll hear back from that a few months from now, hopefully in the positive. And if we do, then we'll launch this satellite or this balloon, excuse me. And for some context here, the microwave images of the filaments that we can collect from this balloon are going to be 40 times more sensitive than any that exist right now. That previous image I showed where you could see the filaments were detected, we're going to be 40 times more sensitive. So now in addition to just detecting them, we can actually map out their properties in detail. OK, so getting back to the fundamental questions that I brought up at the beginning, how are we going to answer those with this flight? And so again, this is looking at this very, you know, the warmer gas that's in the filaments that's at a million degrees and is something like 39% of the normal atoms in our present day universe. So what is the temperature of the gas? This is, again, one of these fundamental questions. And why this is interesting is simulations, they're predicting this gas should be about a million degrees. Even though x-rays, they've detected it and you can try to study the temperature in x-rays, but it's very difficult. But the groups that have tried, they're coming out with gas that's more like 10 million degrees. And so this is a bit of a mystery of why the gas appears to be so much hotter in the x-ray observations than what it's predicted to be. And this is something we hope to disentangle. And again, this is getting back to, you know, is this gas the equivalent of Alaska in January or the equivalent of Death Valley in July? Um, also, how is the gas distributed within the filaments? You know, how, how much denser is it in the middle of the filament along the axis compared to as you move away? And again, this is the question of, you know, are we at sea level or on the top of Mount Everest? And then finally, how is the gas moving within the filaments? And so this is, again, you know, getting back to are we in a hurricane or on a nice calm day at the beach? And for some context here, the prediction is that filament itself, that the gas should be spinning around the axis of the filament. And for some context of scale here, it should be spinning around the axis of the filament. It's something like 200,000 miles per hour. So, you know, a much different scale than uh, things that happen in the Earth's atmosphere. But we want to understand if, if this, you know, spin that's predicted is what's actually going on there. So I will leave there. I'll show this uh, video one last time of the structure formation, and I'll invite any questions. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>